Victoria. Good to be here. Good to see you as well. OK, very good colleagues. So I think we are ready to start um, and to welcome to our last webinar of 2021. Uh, to start with, we, we were reflecting a little bit on this year and realized that we held 14 webinars, so it was qu quite a rich and fruitful year. And uh, today we will close the cycle for 2021 with a very important topic, uh, which is on planning and designing human rights education interventions. And human rights education is something which is really very important and should be at the core of our protection work. And many of you are already working on human rights education in different forms, shapes, uh, while working with uh, the communities, while doing community-based protection. But it's important that we understand really what is this about, uh, how we can maybe structure the interventions better, what are some of the methods we can use and we can uh, also learn from the examples we will hear from other colleagues. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, today we are very fortunate because we have um, very experienced speakers. First, Kay Turner-Mann from the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions. So it's like a regional structure of uh, national human rights institutions in Asia, pa Asia Pacific region. Welcome, Kay. Thank you for being with us today. And then we will also share from our dear colleagues uh, uh, in Philippines uh, from Reina uh, Bermudez, who is the chief of the Center for Crisis, Conflict and Humanitarian Protection. And she's accompanied by uh, her colleague Tamara Damari, specialist on internally displaced persons, who will also stay with us for any questions you may have. So colleagues, um, today is really more of a brainstorming also between us, how we can do better, how we can improve on the human rights education side. You know that we held already one session in June on uh, um, basics of human rights education and thanks Elisa uh, who is online for uh, for preparing that session and also so that you know going ahead the human rights engagement task team is planning to have a full module for you in the field on human rights education so that you can really pick and choose some of the key elements, have some materials ready as you need uh, when you are planning and adjusting your field interventions. So this is what we have ready for you going forward, but uh, I will not <laughs> say too much as of now. Maybe we will see what comes out as recommendations at the end of this session. And I will give the floor to Kate to get us started with a presentation on human rights education and specifically on planning and designing its initiatives. So over to you, Kate, and colleagues, uh, as you are already doing, please introduce yourself in the chat uh, so that we know who is around and you can start posting your questions as you hear from Kate, as you uh, may have some questions that pop in your uh, heads, you can already be putting them down. So over to you, Kate, please. Thank you so much, Valerie, and greetings to everyone from around the world. What an amazing turnout. I love hearing all the different places that you're dialing in from today. These, um, you know, COVID does have some silver linings sometimes in that you can connect everybody from across the world in these kind of different platforms like this. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly and I'll get started. Unfortunately, I can't see the chat box as I'm going through this, so please do just turn off the microphone and let me know if you're having any difficulty seeing my screen or, or hearing me. So I'm actually dialing in from Canberra in Australia, where it's about oh, just after nine o'clock at night. <laughs> the benefits of working with different time zones, I guess. But it's an absolute pleasure to be joining you all this evening or for your day or afternoon, wherever you may be. And I really want to thank the Global Protection Cluster for the opportunity to come and speak about some of the work that the APF has been doing and the approaches we take to human rights education in the Asia Pacific region. So thank you so much for the opportunity. 
And once again, if I'm speaking too quickly or if perhaps I'm not speaking clearly, please just turn off your microphone and let me know. Ask me to slow down. I can get a bit excited when I'm talking about human rights education initiatives. So please do just let me know if I'm talking too quickly. But thank you so much to the Global Protection Cluster and it's lovely to be connected with you all today. So and let me just move a little window. Fantastic. So what are we looking at today and what are we going to use this time to explore? Well, first of all, uh, this presentation is delivered in two parts. I'm very glad to be joined by my colleagues from the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines or CHRP. And what I'll be looking at is a broader perspective and overview on understanding human rights education principles and approaches. I'll be speaking specifically to the logic model. now. Some of this may be familiar to, to some of you, but it may not. And it's just a bit of a recap and an introduction to uh, a way of you can start planning and approaching your human rights education activities. And then I'm going to be um, talking about how this could potentially apply in the context of displacement. And this is also where my colleagues from CHRP will be speaking at length to their experience with undertaking human rights education uh, initiatives in the context of displacement because as you'll hear it's quite a live issue for our colleagues at the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines. Now for those of you who are interested we do have a manual available which is essentially speaking to all the bits and pieces that I'm speaking to today. It's geared for NHRIs which if you're not aware of who they are I'm going to speak to you in a second but it's available to you if you want to download and refresh yourselves in especially in the lead up to what sounds like a good program on understanding human rights education that might be coming up i will put a caveat that it's designed for national human rights institutions but i think it has some principles that you can take forward and apply to any context so just quickly before i get started in case you've not heard of us before the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions is a network of NHRIs from across the Asia Pacific region. Now, as you can see from the map, we have a very, very broad definition of what the Asia Pacific looks like. So we have members based in Palestine, Jordan, Mongolia, Korea, and all the way out to Samoa in the Pacific as well. So we have a very, very broad membership, but one thing that kind of pulls us all together is our shared mandate. NHRIs, if you're not aware of them, they're independent institutions that are established by an act of parliament or by legislation with a mandate to promote and protect human rights. And it's a nice broad mandate, so they can do this in several different ways. They have several different functions, such as investigating complaints of human rights violations. They might be advising their government on policies from a human rights based approach and a key function that NHRIs have is to undertake human rights education to promote and protect human rights. So in this way NHRIs act as the protection gap in a lot of different ways. They hold a mirror up to the state and make sure that the state is meeting its obligations to also provide for human rights as duty bearers. Now the APF, we support the establishment of NHRIs in the region. We currently have 25 members, but there's also um, NHRIs in existence that are not yet um, accredited in, say, for example, Turkmenistan, in Uzbekistan as well, and we're working with those NHRIs. We also support NHRIs with their mandate to be as effective as they possibly can in the promotion and protection of, of human rights and the delivery of their work. And we also advocate for national human rights institutions at the regional, national and international level. Yeah. I keep having to switch between <laughs> screens. It's a bit dis discombobulating, but anyway, I'm hoping you can keep up with everyone. So as I mentioned, a key function of national human rights institutions is really to undertake human rights education. So just a very quick recap, as I know some of you have covered this already, but human rights education seeks to develop essential human rights knowledge, skills, attitudes. And I think this is quite essential in this equation, behaviors 
that enable, that motivate individuals, communities, groups and nations to all contribute to making human rights a reality for all. So in addition to this definition that I've put on the slide in front of you, human rights education really consists of awareness raising, learning and, and empowerment, and I think promoting a culture of human rights. And this is where that behaviours element comes in that I've just mentioned. So what are the goals of human rights education? Again, I'll go through this quickly as I know it might be a bit of a, re a refresher for you or some stuff that you've already heard of before. But human rights education is about learning about human rights to encourage understanding and appreciation of, of rights, norms, principles, values and mechanisms. It's about learning through human rights, which ensures that the way in which human rights education occurs is in keeping with principles, human rights principles and standards. So in effect, we're demonstrating best practice or a human rights based approach in everything we do. And it's also about learning for human rights. And so this involves deepening people's ability to enjoy and exercise their own rights and re to respect and uphold the rights of others. Um, and underpinning all of these goals of human rights education are some general principles of human rights education that need to be at the foundation of any human rights activity that you undertake. Now, I just want to take an, a minute to, to note here, you know, in our protection work that you do, sometimes it can be a very long process and take many years to seek the change that you're, that you're trying to achieve. And this is unfortunately, in some ways, is the nature of human rights work and the work that we're doing. But it's important here to recognise that learning and especially learning about, through and for human rights is really a lifelong process. And, you know, depending on particular context, it may be more difficult than others to really kind of grasp that behavioural changes associated with human rights education um, that we're trying to achieve. So when you're thinking about human rights education, I think it's really important to acknowledge that it's a lifelong process, that it takes some time and it can happen anywhere because learning doesn't have to happen in these classroom settings or in particular settings. It really can happen anywhere. And if we expand that understanding of where human rights education can occur, I think it gives us a lot more flexibility and um, I guess in a way, versatility to be able to implement different things. So human rights education is also based on some principles and some different theories. I'm going to speak more to the principles today, but if you are interested in some of the theories behind human rights education, you're welcome to um, check out the APF manual, as I mentioned. As I said, underpinning every human rights education activity that you'll do as a foundation are these really core six principles of human rights education. So we need to make sure first and foremost that the activity is relevant, that it's participation, it's participant centred, it's going to be useful for the participant at the other end. We really want to make sure that it's collaborative. It's enhanced by partnerships, by collaborations, it's enhanced by inputs of people in the group as well. It's participatory in that people fully participate in it, where they're not just passive recipients of the activity or they're not just sitting there listening to a lecture. They're actually part of the discussion and part of the development of the learning outcomes from the activity as well. Now, human rights education should be probing. It should deepen people's thoughts and it should deepen their knowledge and experience and ask them to really reflect on how they've been viewing a certain situation and reflecting on their own behaviours as well. You want to make sure it keeps diving a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper to meet that behavioural change that we're trying to see. Now we want human rights activities to be based on thoughtful action. 
We want to facilitate change by reflecting and learning from actions. And we want it to be transforming. We want it to be empowering, encouraging, non-discriminatory. We want it to be based on principles of equality and equity, and we want it to be inclusive as well. Now, human rights education, as I was saying in a couple of slides ago, uh, we need to kind of think beyond the, the standard classroom of where learning can happen because there's many different ways you can actually approach human rights education. So we've put together this multi-method approach at the APF, which we think covers most of them. <laughs> of course, there might be some others that uh, you come across in the work or you may be implementing yourself, but this is broadly what we've captured as, as some of the multi-method approaches. All of these approaches will need to be informed by those principles of human rights education. So to start off with, we've got examples I'll share with you now, moving from left to right across the slide, we've got information sharing. So this is about publications, speeches, resource materials, lectures, advisory papers, could be internet resources, could be audio visual um, case study videos, these sorts of things. You've got training which is, um, I feel like, a, a bit of a go-to for a lot of people. This is, a, you know, setting up a training program. And more and more we're seeing this happen online or these quasi-virtual and in-person and in events of training. Um, but it can also be about guiding and coaching as well. It doesn't always have to be that top-down approach. Um, you've got facilitation, and I must admit, I'll put my hand up and say that this is my personal favourite of all the multi-method approaches of human rights education. So facilitation is really about working with individuals or groups to assist them in their human rights endeavours. It's about um, understanding how they can build their own human rights capacity and capabilities. So one example of this is you might be working with a community group to um, seeking their input on housing issues that are affecting them and it's about really guiding that conversation to draw out what are the human rights issues and, and getting people to think back and reflect on what it actually means for them and how they could live out human rights in their day to day. You've also got relationship management. Some examples could be, you know, we could be looking at networking, coordinating, brokering, partnering, um, some tools of this could include newsletters and roundtables, think tanks, task groups, that sort of thing. You've got advocacy as another method, which could be about initiating a campaign or perhaps a national inquiry into a systemic human rights issue. That's one that's very um, well known in the world of NHRIs. You might also be supporting others to self-advocate for, um, for their human rights, or you might be you know, looking at promoting the role and value of human rights more broadly in everything that you're doing. And lastly, we have community led development, which is usually a longer term project or activity, and it could be, say, issue focused, but that's kind of more of the examples we see. It's a longer term project that's focused on a particular issue and or perhaps it's sector focus, like looking at education, for example, or housing, or perhaps detention centres. And it, it also could be geographically focused, so looking at a particular region and human rights in, impacts of a certain initiative on that particular region. So people learn in a variety of different ways, and adults especially, we really need a variety of different methods to engage with our preferred learning styles. Everyone has slightly different styles. Everything works slightly different in people's brains. So we need to have a really good understanding of our audiences, irrespective of whatever approach that I've just put up on the slide here. We have to have a good understanding of our target audience that we're looking to work with. And also we need to apply those principles of human rights education in no matter what we do. So just be open to the fact that you might have to adopt more than one of these methods to achieve the learning outcomes that you've set out to achieve. Now, I am going to dive down a little bit more into um, some of the 
thinking about the planning and the monitoring and evaluating of every kind of activity that we're doing, every human rights activity that we're doing. But before I do, I really want to take stock and think here about gender mainstreaming in all of activities. And sometimes we have the assumption that if we are to gender mainstream an activity, we add men and women into the mix and that's done. We have a gender mainstreamed activity. But it's not quite right. Gender equality in human rights education involves using methods and tools that result in equal outcomes for women and girls and importantly, people of diverse gender identities. So not just men and women, we have to think about the whole spectrum of gender identity as well. And there's two main strategies for achieving this. There's gender mainstreaming and gender specialization. Now, gender mainstreaming involves identifying the gender implications across all stages of an activity. It involves taking action to achieve gender equality. And it's also about making sure that gender norms or assumptions are not perpetuated in the work that you're doing as well. Gender specialization involves providing human rights education activities that's focused specifically on say uh, gender dimensions of a human rights issue, or perhaps looking at those who have experience specifically on gender-based human rights violations, or even those who perpetuate these violations as well. So we want to, the ultimate goal is gender equality in everything that we're doing. We use gender mainstream and, and gender specialization as a way to get there. And also beyond just adding gender to two different genders or more into a room and and getting them to together. It's it's much more comp well not complicated, it just takes a little bit more thought than just mixing gender together. Okay, now I'm gonna have I'm just gonna stop sharing for one second because I'm actually going to move to a video just very, very quickly. Won't be long, everyone just need to swap my screen over. Now, for those of you who haven't seen um, a logic model before, I just wanted to play to you a very, very quick video to introduce this concept. Okay. The great news about creating a logic model is that there's not a right way to construct one. The creative process as you build can flow however works best for you. As you develop your logic model, keep in mind that there are a few key parts to include which will provide a basic structure and solid foundation. The three most basic parts of a logic model are the inputs, the outputs, and the outcomes. Inputs are what we invest into a program. They are the human, financial, organizational, and community resources that will contribute to the program running effectively. We can also look at the inputs as the resources that the program requires in order to be successful. Determining inputs lets us take inventory of what we already have and what we may still need. Outputs are what we offer as an organization. Outputs are the activities, services, events, and products that reach our targeted audience. Activities are what we do. They are what the program does with the resources in order to achieve outcomes. Our activities should be specific enough to understand how our outcomes will be achieved. To make your logic model as clear as possible, have a separate box for each different activity. Participation refers to the people that we reach through the activities. This includes your target participants as well as other groups or individuals with which you plan to interact. Most likely, you will have more than one group of people impacted by your activities. For example, you might be working with students, parents, and teachers. You will likely be doing different activities with each group of people. For clarity, your logic model should have a separate box for each group. Use arrows to show the connection between the activities and participants. These outputs are what lead us to our outcomes. Outcomes are the direct results, specific changes, or benefits to the target participants. Outcomes can be short-term, intermediate, or long-term. Short-term outcomes refer to immediate or initial changes. These outcomes result in the participants learning something. 
Intermediate outcomes are the midpoint changes and result in the participants changing the behavior. Long-term outcomes refer to the ultimate result or impact and require a change to the social, economic, civic, or environmental conditions. Okay, let's get out of that and go back into the presentation and I'll move through the rest of it quite quickly so we can focus on hearing from our colleagues. Oh, sorry, everyone, I have to skip through. So at its basic core, a logic model is a simple framework and it's a systematic way to link the elements of an education activity. So it develops the story about what outcomes are wanted from the activity and how to achieve them and how to determine that you have achieved what you set out to achieve. It involves, we've suggested four elements on top of this one, <laughs> which is this situational analysis, the inputs, outputs and outcomes. So I use this model a lot as does a, a lot of our NHRIs in our network and any kind of human rights activity we actually take on, we have to really think about how do we actually know if we're making an impact if we don't really know where we started? So we use that situational analysis to say, here's where we are and that's what we want to achieve. So we know what that difference will look like. We have to be really clear on what our inputs are going to be what our outputs will be as a result and also what our outcomes are going to be. Now this is a really really important thing and it's something that people get tripped up on quite a lot. Every human rights activity no matter what, no matter how small or how large will involve planning, delivery and evaluation and to help us get into this mindset we use the logic model and also we need to shift into an outcomes focused approach to our activities. So outputs thinking just focuses on what did you do, what did you produce, you ran that training course, you um, set up that campaign, you produce these materials on um, rights of IDPs in a certain country context. But a shift to an outcomes focus thinks about what you will improve, what is going to be the change. And this is a key element whenever you're undertaking any activity that you're doing. You need to have a strong situational analysis. You need to know what your outputs are going to be, what's going to be the result of the activity or the product. But then the next step to that, to telling the story of the change you've achieved, is really focusing on these outcomes. What does success look like? What does change look like? So just quickly, there's no real good definition. Oh, sorry, it's no standard. That's what I meant to say, standard definition for short term, medium term, long term outcomes. So when we're thinking about outcomes, I like to think of them as stepping stones to achieving the ultimate goal that we've set out to ourselves. So long term goals are that ultimate goal. They're thinking about what's going to happen in four or five years time. What's going to be the ultimate change we're seeing? Going back to that situational analysis and thinking, here's our baseline of where we're at. What is the ultimate goal of what we want to try and achieve within that? And, you know, we've had typically they can be a um, aligned to your strategic planning that you're doing. Um, we definitely recommend that, but it also could be involved aligned to say your project specific outcomes that you're seeking. Now, here's where the stepping stone analogy kind of comes in again. Short and medium term out, um, outcomes are changes that happen as a result of your inputs, activities and outputs that lead to your long term outcomes. So short term outcomes typically happen over a few weeks, a few months and medium terms might happen over a few months or a few years. And I've got some examples that I've got on the screen there. But when you're setting your outcomes for yourself, it's very important to acknowledge the milestones or the short term outcomes, these stepping stones 
to achieving the change that you want. Um, now, when we get into the fun part of evaluating our activity after we've done the planning, we know what success looks like, we've implemented the activity. Um, in this planning um, stage as well, we need to be thinking about indicators. Now, indicators, I, I will say that sometimes we can get lost in them. Sometimes we make them overly complicated. And the complexities of human rights activities and human rights education activities, especially in the context and the added dimensions of displacement, can make it quite difficult to understand the impact that you've made. But indicators help you to check that you've done that. Effectively, they're this, they give you a sign that you're on your way or that you're meeting the stepping stones and to achieving that long-term outcome that you're seeking. Now they can be quantitative, so they're typically expressed in numbers, units, prices, percentages, and qualitative. So these are typically expressed in words, um, in case studies, paragraphs, short stories. Now, a good little formula that we like to use is to think about in order to develop a good indicator is to think about the QQTL, and I can write that in the chat box. Quality plus quantity plus time plus location. QQTL will give you a really good indicator. And I will say here that when we are making indicators of what success looks like in our human rights education activities, not to make them too complicated. It's very difficult to be conducting all the activities and doing all the monitoring and evaluation and also with all the other work pressures that you've got going on. So you want your indicators to be manageable and simple and it is totally fine to have one qualitative and one quantitative because I've definitely seen pages and pages dedicated to in, um, all these different indicators which at their core are very good indicators but it's not manageable to have that many indicators. And especially because of the long term nature of human rights work, you want to make sure that your indicators are manageable. Your baseline you can get from your situational analysis. And I will just make a little point here about attribution. There's a lot of actors in the human rights space sometimes. Sometimes it can get pretty busy. <laughs> so if you have really good indicators, it helps you tell the story of your intervention and how your intervention contributed to a specific outcome, recognising that it also might not be just your intervention. There might be other things that happened. So this is why having using the logic model of having a really good situational analysis and a really strong narrative of the inputs, the outputs, and then the outcomes that um, happened as a result of your intervention is a really good way of also telling the story of your intervention and how you and your work contributed to a change. And this is something that um, I think a lot of us in the human rights space need to be a little bit better at, in all honesty, telling that story about how we contributed to change specifically. I was going to do a quick poll, but I think I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up just to say, you know, human rights education to be truly genuine and empowering. It really needs to be based and informed by these human rights education principles. And they ap apply across all the methods and approaches that we've seen. And whenever you're undertaking your human rights activity, the logic model is a really good framework for you to help start planning your activity and then understand to what extent you actually achieved what you set out to achieve. Focusing on outcomes, what's the change you want to see as opposed to what you've done, say a training activity, is a very, very important to, to really contributing at a higher level to human rights impact. And last but not least, gender considerations need to be included at every part of the process to try and promote gender equality in what you're doing. So now we're going to hear from our colleagues at CHRP. I hope I haven't run too much over time. <laughs>
Um, but I'll stop sharing my screen now. I will put up my email address in case you have any contacts, um, if you want to contact me at a later date, but I'll stop sharing now so my colleagues can speak now. Thank you so much, Kate. And as we are moving to Reina's with examples from Philippines, I would encourage colleagues who are online listening to uh, those uh, presentations to start sharing your questions through the chat. If you would like to take the floor directly to share an example or um, some kind of a scenario directly, you can also put your hand up so that we can give you the floor right after Reina's presentation. Thank you and over to you, Reina. Yes, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, good evening from the Philippines, and I think good morning, good afternoon to our colleagues all over the world. Um, is my connection clear? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So um, first, thank you so much for having the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines uh, be part of uh, this activity today. And um, we hope that we'll be able to provide um, a good um, discussion in relation to human rights education in contexts of displacement. So we've heard from Kate um, the different aspects of human rights education, um, how human rights uh, are integrated into um, uh, humanitarian context, for example, and how, like, for example, gender, other aspects of uh, human rights are being mainstreamed. And uh, we, we hope that uh, the experience of the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines will be able to um, uh, show uh, at least like, like a representation of how HRE is being practiced in a displacement context. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, yeah, so um, human rights education in the context of internal displacement in the Philippines. So um, Kate has already shared with us um, a while ago uh, what are NHRIs, what they do. So in the context of um, the Philippines, we have the uh, Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines. We are the national human rights institution um, of the country. So um, we are tasked by the constitution. So we're, we have a mandate from the constitution to um, support human rights in the country and uh, that includes uh, making uh, sure that duty bearers, primarily the state, uh, uphold, protect and promote human rights at all times and uh, that includes situations of crisis and conflict uh, which um, which is a uh, which are a huge aspect of um, internal displacement. So th that's the uh, mandate that we work on in the Commission. So part of the work that we do is we do protection work in displacement areas. So that would include monitoring and evaluation of um, human rights issues in the areas. We also refer cases uh, of GBV, like for example, uh, gender-based violence in humanitarian contexts, uh, children's rights, also of uh, indigenous persons and uh, as well as uh, persons uh, with uh, disabilities. So that's just the range, but there are still more um, other sectors that we cater to. So when we say referral of cases, that would include um, the CHR would do the investigation. Uh, also, uh, we refer to appropriate uh, government instrumentalities or agencies or even uh, non-government and civil society organizations so that they can also look into the issues of, uh, of uh, human rights in displacement context. So um, for policy work, which uh, the Commission is also doing, we craft and disseminate advisories and uh, situation reports of um, IDP issues, as well as we um, conduct le uh, legislation advocacy, and we conduct national inquiries, which are uh, mechanisms within national human rights institutions wherein we get to look deeper into human rights issues in specific contexts. So um, in the case of the Philippines, we have conducted the National Inquiry on Climate Change, which, which is uh, quite popular internationally. Uh, we, we, the, the CHRP has been a uh, good uh, practice on that. Then we also conducted national inquiries on indigenous persons and then uh, the I, uh, IDPs, internally displaced persons so inquiry, is currently ongoing. So uh, those are just the uh, aspects of um, how we conduct our work as NHRI in the policy aspect in displacement context. So, um, yeah. okay. So in the promotion and education work, which I which would be uh, the 
main example of what we will be discussing today. Uh, the CHRP conducts advocacy and information dissemination work in relation to displacement issues, um, education and advocacy activities, uh, which um, go which has the goal of educating IDPs in relation to their rights, um, and also printing and distribution of IPC materials on human rights. Um, Raina, sorry, yes. Raina, sorry to interrupt, but I think you need to click uh, to take control of the slides because I think it's uh, it's staying on the first slide just so that we, we follow along with you. Okay, sorry, Thanks. yeah, I realized. Cool. It's okay, thank you, I, I realized I should be, yeah, like, um, yeah, so this one protection work policy work, as I discussed a while ago. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for that, uh, but uh, yeah. The slides in in the chat so that all colleagues have a copy. So don't worry, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So yeah, I, I, I hope I'm not yet too far from the discussion. So yeah, so um, promotion and education work, again, uh, that's where most of uh, the discussion would revolve. Um, in the context of the Philippines, what we have noticed is that um, in many instances in the displacement areas where we conduct our work, IDPs have a, a lot of um, difficulties um, exercising and enjoying their human rights because they think that um, they are in a context of displacement, they are at the mercy of um, in the evacuation center management, for example, um, the food that they receive come from the government and other NGOs. So basically they feel like um, they are not entitled to enjoy further their rights because of that situation to which we say, now, no, your human rights do not end just because you are in a displacement context. So that's part of what we encourage uh, as we conduct our education, uh, human rights education work in displacement contexts. So um, how the CHRP is doing that? Well, one, we have a standing project with the UNHCR, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and that they've been very supportive of the work of the Commission in relation to pro IDP protection. So part of the work of this project is um, we monitor internal displacement in the Philippines, particularly in Mindanao, wherein uh, most of the displaced populations are. And um, uh, as uh, our IDP protection monitors conduct the monitoring, uh, that this is where we integrate the human rights education ad and advocacy work. So in our on-site monitoring and also remote monitoring, uh, HRE uh, is a part of those activities. So, um, yeah. So the advocacy building and information dissemination aspect will includes setting up community workshops to introduce uh, and mainstream IDP rights. So later I'll, I'll give some examples, but um, the goal here is to empower IDPs and to have better knowledge of their own rights. As I shared um, a while ago, uh, how IDPs are um, understanding their situation. Like they feel like um, they cannot expect so much, they cannot request so much. So they, they just accept what is being given to them, even if what is given is not human rights compliant or that um, some aspects of their displacement are not uh, are not human rights um, focused. So, uh, for example, um, in contexts of armed conflict, we get to see um, the military coming into schools like uh, where um, some IDP evacuees are and um, IDPs uh, do not um, do not uh, fully understand or grasp that there are zones of peace wherein um, armed elements or armed groups are not allowed to enter. So these are parts of uh, what we mainstream in uh, those displacement contexts. So um, yeah, do we do the community workshops to introduce and mainstream the IDP rights. Uh, so part of that are the different um, topics that we discuss. Uh, but the uh, when we do our um, interventions, uh, like the workshops, as well as um, information dissemination, we have certain strategies that we employ so that it would be a, it would have a better impact or a larger um, scope uh, with more people uh, being involved in the process because we believe that how we build IDP rights, how we improve people, uh, IDPs exercise of their rights, include a broader 
approach to ensure that all stakeholders or most of the stakeholders are part of the process. So first we do coordination with local leaders and IDP leaders. So the local government um, executives, for example, are also involved in the different activities. They are briefed of uh, what are the IDP issues in their areas, as well as um, local leaders like uh, at the barangay level, which are um, in the Philippine governance structure are the closest to uh, the communities. So the barang at the barangay level, leaders are also trained on what are IDP rights. So they're also part of this process, not just the IDPs. Also, we create community-based networks. Community-based networks are um, groups of IDPs who, um, who would like to become um, like our focal persons in the areas where they are. Um, they act as uh, monitoring support. So when we do the monitoring, they assist in the conduct of activities. Also, they refer issues to the commission or um, they also use the referral pathways that are available in their areas. So basically, this is like a, like a, a structure wherein the IDPs themselves become involved in uh, the monitoring aspect. So when we do that, our community-based networks are also trained and uh, we also um, involve them in information dissemination. Also, a wide range of stakeholders are oriented and trained on IDP rights. Uh, so the barangay leaders, there are also instances wherein we um, work with the security sector. So um, we involve different um, members within the Commission on Human Rights to provide different human rights education activities. And then we also have a more focused IDP rights um, orientation to them. So they, they have the basic or the bigger human rights orientation and then we zero in as well on IDP rights because, for example, our security sector are also involved in the displacement, uh, in displacement management, and um, they are part of the peace and the order situation. So the, it's very important that they know what are the rights of um, all persons that they cater to, uh, including IDPs. So, yeah, integration of different human rights topics with focus on IDPs. Uh, that, that's uh, that's what I uh, just shared. So yeah, um, for education activities, uh, this ones. Um, these are just uh, some of the discussions that uh, we are having and some of our interventions. Um, we do trainings on IDPs uh, of IDPs on human rights. Uh, we also do trainings on the ONPED, uh, which would include IDP rights discussion, as well as distribution of uh, ONPED materials to communities. Uh, we also discuss protection against sexual exploitation and abuse. And, um, and another um, important aspect for us in our legislative advocacy, we include um, IDP legislation advocacy into the trainings that we conduct. So, yeah, for our training on IDP rights, um, how we structure it is that uh, in our training plans, we have a basic human rights discussion in, uh, with IDP stakeholders. So attendees, are IDPs and uh, we provide a uh, basic human rights orientation, so right to life, right to um, right to security, um, economic, social, and cultural rights. So we discuss these things and then we zero in on what are the IDP rights, um, which uh, we, would, we would include in the discussion on uh, training on UMPED. And uh, we do this so that IDPs better understand their rights. And again, as what we um, always emphasize to communities, that their displacement does not end their enjoyment of human rights. Their rights are intact even if they are in situations of crisis and conflict. So um, we also include here education um, on referral pathways. So we um, introduce them, what are the referral pathways? Like if something happens in the displacement camp, for example, gender-based violence, there was domestic violence happening in the camp, what, what must they do? So um, we educate them on, for example, um, the exercise of the Anti-Violence Against Women and Their Children Act which would provide that um, the barangays or the police have a mandate in assisting women who are victims of domestic violence. So, so those are just uh, that's just an example. And then other human rights violations, um, 
if there are um, some uh, HRVs happening, uh, the the commission through the IDP protection monitor um, can be uh, accessed through text messages, also um, through Facebook or other mechanisms wherein they can report their issues. So we, we educate the IDPs that they have these opportunities that they can report issues so that they can still continue having a, a peaceful and um, they can enjoy their human rights further in context of their displacement. So on uh, training on ONPID, so we, we have a very specific uh, discussion on ONPID because um, the ONPID as a starting point for our discussion is important because this is where we get to establish the accountability mechanisms. So uh, human rights, again, are, do not end in context of displacement. And to protect the rights, people must know who must be held accountable in um, ensuring that uh, there is no human rights violation happening in, in displacement areas. So um, OMPED also provides the importance of durable solutions that um, whether IDPs would like to be resettled, relocated, or they move to a third location, um, they they know what are their rights, who must be supporting that achievement of durable solutions, what uh, must be the process for it. And uh, the OMPED provides uh, that uh, mechanism. So when we do our IDP rights orientation, we highlight that um, the importance for them to, uh, to reach their durable solutions. Um, one of the, um, one of the um, I won't say criticism, but more of an observation that we're having usually on the ground is um, support to IDP communities is there. Uh, we commend the Philippine government for having a structure for that, um, for that support to IDP communities present. However, there's still a need to integrate human rights into those processes. For example, it's not enough to provide food to communities. There must be a process wherein um, consultation, for example, with communities must be included in the programming because um, if we're just going to rely on what is being provided, uh, there might be gaps that uh, might not be covered. So, for example, delivery of food uh, must be food must be nutritious, for example, or adequate, or that uh, it's easily accessible. Um, in many instances in the Philippines, whenever there is a provision for food, sometimes nutritional value is not included or not considered. Um, also, um, uh, say in the provision of hygiene kits, um, women's rights or uh, gender uh, issues are not are not really considered or reflected in the programming. So access to um, sanitary napkins, for example, or tampons, um, but uh, uh, those um, as uh, those needs that are very specific for women are not included in the programming. And if you have a more human rights focused um, support in relation to those um, aspects, and the IDPs know that uh, they are uh, they 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 have rights that correspond and must be addressed in this programming, then it's better for them to be able to assert uh, those rights. And uh, those um, information as included in our trainings on UNPED uh, are, are very important. So um, next, protection against sexual exploitation and um, actually it's, it should be abuse. So um, yeah, so in PISEA, um, we look into uh, the humanitarian assist, uh, we look at uh, the responsibilities of humanitarian service providers towards IDPs. So we include PISEA in our discussions with communities because it's important that IDPs know how, um, for example, humanitarian workers should interact with them. And, um, and in that aspect, they, they would know like if something is happening, um, say in relation to gender-based violence, they will know how to go about it. They will know to whom they should uh, report. And uh, they know what are, what could be the accountability mechanisms so that perpetrators of, um, for example, gender-based violence, 
will be held accountable. So that's why we also include uh, PISEA in our uh, training activities. So, um, and then uh, this one is important for us as a, the, as a national human rights institution to integrate the legislative advocacy for the passage of an IDP bill um, in the Philippine Congress. Uh, it's important that IDPs know uh, that um, there is a legislation that is being proposed so that their rights can be institutionalized as law. Um, right now, the Philippines does not have any um, human rights-based legislation focusing on protecting IDP rights. And part of our education activities is to mainstream that there is a need for such legislation because that legislation um, can uh, directly support um, IDPs in uh, in the context of their displacement and moving towards their durable solutions. That's why um, we include IDP le uh, legislative advocacy into our um, into our education activities. So uh, that and um, other aspects of um, education and uh, like training, also coordination with communities. Uh, capacitating them and um, distribution of um, educational materials, especially now in the context of COVID, we conduct text blasts. So through text messages on how to uh, prevent contracting COVID, so basic um, hygiene in um, IDP areas. So that's part of um, the advo advocacy on um, information dissemination in relation to IDP rights. So, um, yes. So, challenges and opportunities that uh, we are seeing in the context of our um, in the context of our work. Um, challenges. Well, one, there's really a difficulty in assessing impact uh, due to limited follow up. So, we we connect that to one. We have limited manpower in the commission to conduct a thorough follow through. So, um, in in assessing uh, how how communities change or how IDPs change their behavior or attitude um, in relation to um, exercise of IDP rights, it's quite difficult to assess that because we have limited people to conduct uh, the follow-ups, as well as um, there are a lot of places with displacement, and we cannot solely focus on just one area. We rely now on community-based networks who are um, in the ground and uh, they are the ones who provide us feedback but uh, that's not as thorough for example as um, doing a uh, the, doing a um, like a, an analysis on how behaviors and attitudes have changed. Um, assessment of knowledge is easier because it, we can we just provide like a Post test after our trainings, for example. So knowledge, it's easier to assess. But as for the changes for the, uh, in the attitudes and behaviors of our IDPs, uh, it's quite difficult. Also, there's difficulty in tracking IDPs when we do our orientations, for example, in IDP sites. Um, next thing, there they might be moving to another like a transitory shelter, or they might be moving back to their homes. And it's quite difficult now to track them. So, and uh, you know, just to check if the, there are changes in their um, attitudes and behaviors. Also, changing local environment, um, for example, uh, issues on mobility because of COVID-19. The restrictions uh, make it difficult for us to access communities. Also, local politics um, affect how. Uh, for example, the commission reaches the communities uh, so, we, so we can conduct our assessments. So these are just some of the factors that uh, we see on the ground. Um, limited opportunities to assess the application of knowledge. So uh, that I, I touched on that in my previous example. And uh, yeah, the COVID-19 restrictions, like the movement and um, also for IDPs themselves, it's uh, difficult for them to uh, be, to be more um, engaged since it's difficult to organize themselves because of the COVID restrictions in their camps or in the areas where they live. So those are just some aspects of the challenges that we experience in our work. And um, opportunities, however, um, are uh, there are still some opportunities that we bank on. So, for example, the community-based networks. 
a very important aspect of our um, community organizing in relation to IDP monitoring. So because of these community-based networks, even if the commission is not capable of always returning to the areas, uh, the community-based networks help in um, in ensuring that um, IDP rights uh, are, are still upheld in, in situations of displacement. Of course, this is not uh, perfect, uh, but uh, this is a good opportunity uh, for us to maintain our presence on the ground. And in many aspects for communities, presence is protection. So when they know that the commission, for example, as the National Human Rights Institution is there, and we have this mandate to protect human rights, um, communities feel that there's a certain form of protection uh, that um, that is available for them. And then um, continue to involve more stakeholders. So that would include the local leaders, the security sector, local chief executives, and um, the more people that we involve in our human rights education activities, uh, the better for us to have a stronger um, community that uh, would uphold and protect human rights, uh, particularly for persons in displacement contexts. So uh, there. Um, yeah, thank you very much. If you have questions, I can stay. So uh, it's it's a good thing I'll be able to stay and uh, answer questions. Uh, my colleague Tamara Damari is also here, so um, she can also answer some of your questions if uh, you may have them. So again, thank you so much, and um, we hope that uh, you learned a lot from our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rina. I see some applause coming from colleagues. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I was receiving some initial questions, uh, also bilaterally colleagues, uh, don't feel shy to post them directly on the chat so that everybody can see them, but uh, let me uh, come back to you with the initial sets of questions, um, both to Kate and Reina and Tamara. So to start with Kate, um, can you share what are some of the lessons learned from applying the logic model on the human rights education? What have you learned so far in the different countries? What can you share? So this is the first question. The second question is uh, related to how do you actually create space for human rights education uh, in displacement context? So when uh, the displaced communities are preoccupied about their um, basic needs such as food, uh, such as shelter, and uh, they may not be attentive uh, um, at this time to, to more of a sensitization activities or engagement on the human rights education front. So how do you deal with that situation? What would be your recommendations? And also questions to Reina and Tamara. Uh, so you, thank you again for your examples from uh, Philippines. Can you share a bit more details about uh, um, how you engage with uh, the education sector? Is it primary? Is it secondary? Um, how do you collaborate with the government? Do you mainstream the human rights education into the curriculum or do you come for specific sessions? How is it done practically? And also, uh, despite what you just said uh, in terms of challenges and the difficulties to measure impact, can you share some examples uh, that you have already tracked and seen in terms of positive impact of your interventions around human rights education in Philippines? So what were the results that, uh, that you saw? So I suggest we start from uh, there and colleagues, you can keep posting your questions or raise your hand if you would like to take the floor and maybe share uh, with others directly your experiences, examples, uh, questions, etc. Very good. So um, Reina, would you like to start with Tamara and then over to Kate? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Um, maybe uh, on um, the question in relation to how we um, integrate human uh, human rights into the curriculum, and if there are experiences as re uh, as regards how the knowledge on human rights uh, tra uh, translate to um, better human rights situations in displacement contexts. So uh, for the curriculum, yes, we are working, for example, with um, the 
education sector, the Philippine education sector, on integrating human rights in um in I think in tertiary education. We're already working on that. Our human rights uh prom education and promotion um office, uh headed by um our um director by, by director uh, Tom Temprosa, he uh, they conduct um discussions with uh, the Commission on Higher Education, I believe, in relation to integrating um, human rights into tertiary um, education. I, I have, I don't have extensive knowledge of that, but I believe that we already have that. Um, but the uh, inclusion of the human, of, in, of internal displacement, internal displaced persons rights um, are included in those, but not as focused, but uh, they are also, in, but they are included in, in what are uh, being, um, provided in in relation to hre so um that part of uh, what we mainstream as well into the curriculum of um this time of the security sector um the armed forces of the philippines and the philippine national police is the integration of human rights and ihl into their curricula so the chr has been very active in um the drafting of uh, the graduated curricula of the um, AFP and the PNP. Uh, we are part of um, the process for integration of different human rights into their curriculum. So uh, I think in 2019 was the latest review that they had. So we included IHL issues, uh, including uh, some displacement um, concerns and uh, human rights uh, concerns in displacement, as well as um, upholding of economic, social, and cultural rights. So at least on, the le on that level, we are able to um, integrate uh, different aspects of human rights into their curricula. Uh, very focused on IDP rights, none yet, uh, but uh, at least the the basic or uh, the very um, you know the, the basic human rights um, issues or uh, concerns or um, uh, aspects and concepts are pretty much already integrated in in the curricula. And then on the concrete example on how we can assess whether the knowledge was uh, translated to um, practice, uh, again, we, we have a lot of uh, difficulties in following up because of the challenges I shared. But I believe there are there's uh, uh, an example wherein um, women are able to uh, organize themselves after um, discussions and uh, empowerment sessions uh, through human rights education uh, with uh, our regional office. I think it, it's in Zamboanga that uh, women were um, we went women IDP women were um, were involved in uh, training orientation focused on IDP women's rights in uh, focused on women's rights in displacement context. So uh, that uh, that aspect they were able to organize themselves and. Uh, for us, that's already a good example of how um, how consciousness in relation to human rights is helpful in bringing people together towards a specific cause, which in this case is the protection of rights in displacement contexts. So there. Um, did I miss any other question, Barry? I'm sorry. I, I think, um, but I think those are the questions that. Uh, that were uh, raised to us. And um, if my colleague Tamara would have some inputs, uh, of course, we can uh, accommodate. But uh, I turn over the floor, Valerie. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara. Would you like to let her do we go? We go to Kate. Fantastic. Over to you, Kate. Let me just make sure my microphone's on. OK, um, I think Thank you for the questions. It's great to see the chat box um, kind of sparking and coming alive as we've been talking. It's been a wonderful. In terms of lessons learned from applying the logic model, I'd actually say the biggest lesson we've learned from the APF in um, our work is not applying the logic model, in fact, because sometimes we've conducted an activity and we've sort of conceptualized and thought about what we wanted to do and we've put all this time and effort and energy into developing it and delivering it and then we come back to the reporting stage and if, to get a real picture of how exactly it went 
we really needed a bit of a situational analysis at the beginning. We really needed more of a baseline to understand how this would be really relevant and useful to our member NHRIs. So we've conceptualized something, we've implemented it, we've patted ourselves on the back because it was great, it was of high quality. But when we actually started reflecting on what we did, we realized we didn't take as much time at the very beginning to actually understand what the situation was and to really involve the participants of the program. In this case, it would have been our member NHRIs. So for us, we actually learned more in not having one at the time when we actually had to reflect on our work because we didn't have the answers to the questions we were seeking. What was the impact? How was that change? How did that change occur? Was there any positive or negative aspects of it? So the logic model actually gives you that opportunity to tell the story. And after you've implemented your activity, you can go back and see if the what happened in reality actually matched what you had conceptualized in practice. Um, another thing I would say is, first and foremost, we learned from not having one. And secondly, a big thing that we learned was to manage our expectations around it as well. So we would be like, there's this great capacity development activity on human rights defenders and everyone's going to start implementing national legislation on human rights defenders. Not quite. Um, the <laughs> our expectations should have been adjusted slightly, that it's part of an ongoing learning process and it's through other channels and means of encouragement and engagement that you can start to build up this momentum to then establish a national um, campaign for legislation on human rights defenders. So that management of expectation, really understanding the situation and having that story to refer back to has been some real lessons learned that we from the APF have definitely felt. Um, in regards to the question around creating space for human rights education activities in IDB and IDP context, I think something to consider is that there's there's the multi-method approach to human rights education. And when we think of human rights education, we need to think of it in its broadest possible sense. So we've heard some really great examples from CHRP. You know, they've been using all these different methods. They have set training programs, not just with IDPs themselves, but also those stakeholders who are working in and around the space of IDPs. They have, you know, these great like network communication blasts, these great community networks, all these different methods and approaches. Because if you if you say to someone, hey, we're going to invite you to a training program on your rights as an IDP, they might not necessarily turn around and see the value in that. And for human rights education to be um, as transforming as we want it to be, we need to think back to those principles of participatory and relevant and collaborative. We need to ask people we're working with, what they want to see come out of the program. So I think it's a really important consideration to make sure that, you know, you're not just setting up a training program. Human rights education is a very broad space and there's multiple different ways that you can address it. And, you know, sometimes I, I think a lot of value that NHRIs have and also um, actors in the protection clusters is that they're there to listen to the story because, you know, these IDPs have had a very, very traumatic experience where they are, and there's that constant re-traumatizing of the uncertainty of their particular situation. So having a supportive ear, not someone who's sitting there trying to make their situation better for them necessarily, but someone who listens and really understands the sort of challenges that's facing them is a huge asset. And having that collaboration with them to say, I've heard your challenges. How can we best support you? OK, here's a program that we might have that we think would help. That's going to be a huge, huge benefit. So making sure you're always coming to people with the foundation of those human rights education principles. Fantastic. Uh, some more reactions. So we go to the second round. I say I will give you the floor. First, I will just uh, mention the comment from Abdi Mahat, who is asking, how have you managed maybe to have some specific targeted initiatives 
for girls who may have uh, some special needs and also in the context of COVID, maybe how COVID-19 has impacted the human rights education activities um, in that regard. And also Ali is sharing a very important reflection that this is human rights education is a long process. And you said it, Kate, too. It's not a change from one day to another. It never stops, actually. And it does not depend only on us. There are many different stakeholders, including the government. Um, so uh, it's important that we work with other uh, entities and stakeholders, and uh, uh, we can use this model, logic model, to look also at uh, long term intermediate, midterm, long term impact. So um, it's, uh, I believe, highlighting the importance of having other stakeholders on board, collaboration as well. But I give the floor now to Shaista. Um, Shaista, over to you. Thank you very much, Valerie, and thank you very much, colleagues. I really appreciate the very comprehensive and very elaborative uh, presentations from all of the presenters. In regards to my point of view, I would like to stress upon three points which are major concern for me. First of all, uh, cross-sectoral linkages of human rights education with all sectors. It's very crucial because we do stress on human rights engagement overall and then education and definitely will lead into programming for protection. And then, of course, connecting the dots with all these international and human treaties and instruments. But my request is if possibly next time or within the time period of next year, if we can organize something on connecting the dots with all other sectors. And apart from that, I would also like to stress because we work in very conservative and deep field environments and it's unlike, you know, big cities and big countries where everything is acceptable by the government and the community as well. So if we can also talk about our touch base, the principle of do no harm, how can we possibly mainstream this principle because this is very much required in our area of responsibility. Last but not the least, the subject matter of accountability towards affected population. We do engage with community of concern, but time to time and on our need basis, whenever we are in need of getting in touch with them or engaging with them. So my request would be if we can holistically sit together and plan the engagement of community of concern throughout our operations management cycle and not only during the implementation, during the advocacy as well, during the community advocacy as well, because they are the ones who can tell us what matters and how they would like to see the change evolve and in terms of behavior change as well. So this is what I wanted to say and thank you very much for the wonderful presentations. Thank you so much, Shaista. I'm also sure that Carolina from the advocacy task team is very uh, keen to provide some, shed some lights on the advocacy part. But first, I will give the floor back to uh, colleagues, uh, our dear colleagues panelists. Uh, Reina, Tamara, Kate, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you, Valerie. Um, as regards, um, I, I, I was not able to fully note uh, the question as re in relation to girls. Uh, the one you you said valerie so uh, if it's okay I'll, I'll answer that maybe a little while um, but for uh the other question on covid 19 impacts um and how it impacts human rights uh, education um covid 19 really created a lot of difficulties for us in the conduct of our activities physically because of the restrictions in mobility as well as um we had issues wherein we have to be very um we have to be very uh careful as well and cautious on how we approach the work going to the communities because um we have to make sure that we are we are healthy when we go there because we do not want to carry the virus going to the communities especially during the early days of the uh, COVID wherein everyone's just, you know, clueless on how to move around and move about. So um, that's why we opted to do remote IDP monitoring work. And uh, when we did that, um, we relied primarily on text messages. So we conducted, um, what do you call it, text blasts. So we um, shared IDP, uh, COVID-19 in IDP, situation 
um, text messages, providing them with basic information on hygiene, like um, hand washing, um, how COVID is um, how COVID is uh, spread. So we um, in, we promote in our text messages social distancing. We improve uh, messaging for um, for uh, basic uh, for, for basic hygiene, um, access for access to um, health materials and health items. So uh, those are parts of how we try to reach communities even a COVID nineteen situation. Um, when we do when we are able now to work um, with our uh, physically in our on-site monitoring, of course we conduct. Um, the basic health protocols, and then um, we also uh, focus now on how important it is for IDPs to be able to access health. So um, that that becomes a central aspect as well of our human rights education activities for them. Um, we have not fully returned yet in um, our physical monitoring because from time to time restrictions are um, being imposed in relation to the number of cases. So if the cases go high, um, movement is stopped. So whatever human rights education activities that we have, like training, orientation, etc., we have to move them. But uh, we, we try our best not to be constrained with those issues, but instead uh, find other opportunities to reach communities. Um, yeah, the, the Center for Crisis, Conflict, and Humanitarian Protection, uh, which is the focal unit of the Commission in relation to displacements, um, we also come up with our social media advocacy on um, improving um, and on continuing human rights education and advocacy, even if we cannot go to the communities. So we, um, we post updates as well as um, when we, whenever we have our situation reports, we also share them. So that's that's uh, one of the things that we do to improve people's information in relation to COVID and displacement. So yeah, um, uh, as for the do no harm uh, uh, that was uh, raised by our colleague here, um, the commission stream, um, the, commi the commission mainstreams um, the humanitarian principles internally at least so we equip our idp focal persons our idp protection monitors on um discussions in relation to humanitarian principles so um impartiality neutrality humanity independence and then the do no harm so at least whenever they do their work on the ground they know what to do without um with, with making sure uh, they know what to do and making sure that uh, they are compliant with both human rights and humanitarian standards so, yeah. Um, Valerie, if I may ask, what was the question again in relation to the gen uh, girls aspect, gender aspect? Very good. I'm aware, uh, unfortunately, of the time that we are uh, okay. at the end of our session. Um, so the question was, um, have you had any targeted um, uh, interventions for girls uh, uh, in terms of human rights education uh, during the COVID time, given their special needs? Uh, you have mentioned the project you had at regional level. So maybe if possible, even after the session, to share a summary um, that we could circulate to colleagues so that they have more details on, on this example you shared. That would be uh, very good if possible. Reina. Yes. Thank and you. Yeah, we'll just share um, at a later time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lena. And I turn for to Kate for the um, some reflections before we come to the close. Over to you, Kate. Sure. Thanks, everyone. Um, I've just posted in the chat as a study that we conducted on the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls in the Asia Pacific region and some of the responses that our NHRI members had been undertaking in order to do that. Um, and in terms of uh, specialised programs um, in relation to women and girls and gender considerations throughout COVID-19, I think first and foremost, um, when you're approaching it, you need to do a look at your situation through a gender lens and do a gender and gendered analysis of how some of your activities may impact people differently because of gender. So, for example, one thing that we had to uh, 
adjust is we had to be very, very flexible in terms of the time of when we actually ran our programs because we needed to be cognizant of homeschooling and <laughs> um, domestic duties that largely fell to women to undertake during COVID lockdowns and restrictions. So really trying to think about what are the different gender dimensions and then adjusting your work accordingly and, and, and trying to be responsive and considerate of all those things. We also um, really wanted to get the input of of specific groups who were working on gender um, issues as well. So for us, that was our NHRIs. We really wanted to get their expertise on how they'd been dealing with this um, particular in particular response to make sure that they were really considering women and girls. So for us, it was about reflecting on our own practice internally and trying to be as flexible and accommodating as humanly possible, understanding the gender dimensions of this, and also reaching out to our members to see if they need any specific uh, support around the gender dimensions of their work and trying to collate best practices together. And there's that publication. Um, just as a very quick side, because I know people have to go, I just wanted to say thank you to Shaista for um, mentioning those specific things. I think um, it, in its essence, the human rights education principles really do try to live up that do no harm aspect, but it doesn't hurt ever to try and mainstream and have that more upfront and present in all of the activities that you're doing. And I, I wanted to say thank you also for mentioning this point about accountability. Something I shared in the chat box was a resource that the APF published on monitoring evaluation, accountability and learning. We added another letter to the m &E acronym <laughs> or another two actually because we really we really I think it's very important that in the planning and undertaking of the activities you are accountable accountable to the stakeholders and especially the IDPs as I mentioned they're in quite a vulnerable state already they're potentially vulnerable to re-traumatizing as well they need to be involved in the process and they also need to have that communicated back to them if they've told their story to you you need to communicate back what it means what the next steps are manage expectations of what that actually is and that's a huge part of this accountability process that needs to be needs to be really there so I know that it feels like a lot of additions and add-on works but to add to your projects and activities, but actually at the end of the day, what it means is though maybe you don't do as big or as bigger, broader activities as what you would originally hope for, but what you'll have is something of substance, something that you can be really assured that you approached it in a fully human rights-based way, that you were fully living up the principles and that in the end, this will have more positive longer term impacts and sustainability for change. Well, one minute to go. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, both Kate and Reina. I'm sure we could continue for longer, but uh, again, this is a continuation of various initiatives on human rights education that we have been uh, conducting. And as mentioned at the beginning, we will uh, be developing a specific module on human rights education that will be uh, available for, for all of you, dear colleagues. So you will hear again from us. And uh, thanks again for sharing all the resources. Also in the chat, colleagues, you can definitely reach out to Kate, Reina, I take the liberty as well as other colleagues, Carolina put her contact in the chat to us as the human rights engagement task team if you have more questions going forward. And uh, we look forward to reconnecting with you again in January for the next uh, thematic webinar. And if you have any suggestions on topics you would like to see coming in 2022, we would be very keen to receive your, um, your ideas and suggestions. So thank you again. Thanks to all colleagues in the field who, who joined. Thanks to our panelists and uh, have a good end of the year. And if we are not um, uh, hearing from each other before, uh, looking forward to reconnecting in January. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Thank bye, you. bye. Thank you, Valerie. Bye.